Well, today is our gift day. And we, um, this is linked with our vision day, which we had last Sunday. And we really talk um, about the vision of the church on these a couple of Sundays um, near the beginning of um, each new year. And we want to kind of set in, uh, in context what God has called us to do, but also how we're going to go about doing it and how that's going to be enabled by us as the church community. Now, um, can I just have a show of hands? How many people um, were here last week? Okay, uh, just flip it around. How many people weren't here? So it's about half and half. Okay, that's um, expected that. So um, in a nutshell, I want to just explain what, um, what the vision of the church is all about. So nine years ago, this church had uh, about 10 or 12 people left in it. And they were going to close the church. Um, and the Bishop of London thought, no, let's give this church another um, chance. And he spoke to the vicar of Holy Trinity Brompton in West London and said, how about planting a new congregation here? And uh, Louis, my wife, and me and our three children and another 95 people, 100 all of us all, all together, came uh, from that church to come and start a new service and to join with the existing group of 12 um, in, that, uh, uh, in this church. It was a shock to the system for the church here, um, but they thought, actually, we'd rather have that than close. And so um, and we had a fantastic journey the first few months and years as we got to know each other, as we began to get to know the area. Eighty of those people already lived in East London, and they were commuting across London to go to church. And they said, let's go more local. Twenty people were in our connect group in West London, and they came over with us and moved house. Some people sold their houses to come and um, buy here, which was amazing. And since then, God has been doing amazing things with us as a church. We've seen this church grow, um, both in depth of kind of coming to understand God's calling for us here, but also a number. We've had something like 800, 900 people coming through as members, committed members of the church over the last nine years. And just because of people kind of moving around um, the capital and moving around the, um, the world, really, uh, there's a kind of quite a throughput of the church. We've got 350 members now. But during this time as well, we've been planting churches as well. We've been doing the same thing as we did here to other church communities. So in 2010, we were invited to send a congregation to Bethnal Green, to St. Peter's there. And we sent about 20 people there. Um, they went from 20, they're now over 100, 120, something like that, and growing. Over in Bow, um, that's about two miles that way, but um, Bethnal Green, two miles that way, Bow, there were seven people left in the congregation. We said, look, um, they were going to close the church. We said, would you like us to, uh, to keep you open and actually to give you a, 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 some staff and to get your church re restarted? And they said, they, they didn't like it to start with, but then they said, okay. Um, and now that church is over 120, something like that. Um, and they've got two services. They're growing as a church. And it's just completely transformed that church community. Um, we, uh, last year, we, went, um, we were invited by the uh, vicar on the Isle of Dogs to um, send a congregation there, uh, um, and uh, we sent about 15 adults and about um, 15 children to St. Luke's Millwall, and um, actually Dan, who was drumming tonight, is from that church. He's the worship leader, so thank you, Dan, wherever you are. I can't see you. Um, and um, that's been fantastic to see that church beginning to grow as well, beginning to gain momentum. And God has called us to see Shadwell, this area around this church, but also East London, transformed by Jesus. We're going to play our part in that process, along with the other churches in this borough and, uh, and in East London. Um, God has called us here to do that by making disciples. That's both encouraging each other to grow in our discipleship, but also people who are not even in the, um, in the church or in, in the kingdom yet, encouraging them to be disciples bit by bit um, so that uh, they make that profession of faith, they come to follow Jesus. Making disciples is what we're about. Also, seeing our communities transformed. We do that through lots of different projects, different things that we do, including people, some people moving into the area long term to say, I want to make a difference in this area, one life at a time. And then thirdly, planting churches, which I've talked about already, making disciples, transforming communities, and planting churches. That's what we're about as a church. We're going to keep doing that um, for a long time, hopefully, um, so that in... 356 years time, that's how old this church is, um, we'll see a whole new 
generation of people being reached in different ways for the gospel. So in our vision, visions cost money, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about money today. And so if this is your first time here, we don't always talk about money, um, but you're very welcome to be here. And if you are a visitor, um, we want to encourage you not necessarily to give to here if you want to, you're very welcome to, but to give to your own church if you're a part of your own church. If you are thinking about making this your church, we'd love to encourage you to do that. You might like to think about whether to give to this, but we're not asking you to give tonight. So this, um, this passage in the scriptures is an interesting one for us. Uh, the Macedonian church that Paul is writing about He's writing about Macedonian church, which is, uh, Macedonia is a place to the northeast side of Greece, and um, the, uh, it's a special place for Paul because there was a moment where he was in Turkey um, and just thinking, you know, he felt the spirit telling him he couldn't go north, he couldn't go south, he couldn't go um, east, and he was just, and the sea was in the way, um, going west, and he didn't know what to do, and he was praying, and there, he had this vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come. We need you. Come. And so he went to um, preach the gospel in Macedonia, went by ship to that area, and people began to become Christians, and the Macedonian church was born. And he, he refers to them here as a church that was under extreme um, d- challenge and difficulty. It's like the recession that we've had, but times 100. They were being persecuted as well for their faith. They were under extreme pressure, and yet they were generous. And Paul is wanting to use this example of the Macedonians as he's speaking to Corinthians, who are a bit further down in Greece, um, to say, look, this is a great example of how to give, and I want to encourage you to give in the same way. And so it sets a great context for us. We've been through a recession. How do we go about giving? How do we think about this? And there are three words I want to just think about as we look at their situation. The first one is that our giving should be sacrificial. Just look at verse 2, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. They'd already given under extremely difficult circumstances. They were under huge pressure. It's, it was in the midst of a severe trial. I wonder what was going on there. Perhaps um, some, of their, um, some of their church had been persecuted or even kind of put in prison. Um, perhaps uh, some of them had uh, fallen ill. We're not quite sure exactly what was going on there, but they were under a severe trial. They didn't have many resources. There was extreme poverty. Paul refers to this here. And thirdly, their circumstances, though, didn't change their attitude. They gave out of um, an overflowing joy. Extraordinary is that in the middle of um, a massive trial, they had overflowing joy. That's what Jesus can do, even in really, really challenging situations. When we focus on him, he's able to give us a completely different perspective on our lives, on the pressures that we face, on our finances, on our workplace, and so on. Um, I came across uh, a story of a, um, uh, a pastor in Korea, and he was showing a visitor um, uh, his area. It was in the countryside. And as they were walking along, a um, new church building had been built, and um, they passed this uh, father and son in a paddy field. And they were working the paddy field with just a plow. It's working very, very hard. Um, through and normally you would use an ox to draw the plow and the um, visitor said to the pastor I guess they must be really really poor just thinking they didn't have an ox and the pastor said yeah that's um, that family is um, the Chinevi family and when the church was built they didn't have anything to give to the church but they wanted to help to see that church built and so they took their ox and they sold the ox and gave the money for the church to be built. And so that's why this spring, they are using the plow on their own. And there was a pause in the conversation. And the visitor said to the pastor, that, that must have, that's such a great sacrifice. And the pastor said to this visitor, they don't see it as a sacrifice. 
they're just so thankful that they had an ox to sell. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. How did the Macedonians give? They gave, look at verse 3. They gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. They gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. What is beyond our ability to give? I think it's giving everything that we have. In one of those songs just now, it was about saying, you know, I'm, am I prepared to give myself to God in exchange for the treasure that he gives to us? When it comes to money, money is one of the last things, isn't it, that holds us. We have great fear in letting go of money. Not letting go to see it wasted, but actually letting go because we are so fearful of will we be able to keep going without the money that we have. It's about giving what we have and giving ourselves and giving all that that means, even beyond their ability. I think it raises questions, doesn't it, about what is sacrifice for us? I think in our generation, we're suspicious, aren't we, of institutions. We're suspicious of giving to something where there's no accountability. We don't want to um, sacrifice something where we can't see the end point, we can't see the purpose of it. And that affects many, many different um, aspects of life and and society that we live in today. There are great problems with that. I think it's right to have accountability. But I think if we stop, if we hold ourselves back all the time from committing to things or giving ourselves to things or people or activity, then we've got problems because we will never move beyond the starting blocks. We'll be held back by fear and mistrust. So for us, in the same way that it was for the Corinthians, they they needed persuasion to give. They needed that encouragement to give sacrificially. If you're not used to giving... Um, when it comes to giving financially, I think we're not talking about loose change. Loose change is not sacrificial giving. So if I um, say I earn 20,000 pounds a year, that's underneath the average for um, people um, in the capital. And I give, say, what's in my change, my loose change, I've got, I haven't got anything in here. Oh, I'll give it next week. Um, I'll give a, you know, what I've got next week, maybe a pound, a couple of pounds. On average, people tend to, when they give like that, they tend to give about a pound a week on average. 50 pounds a year, um, because you might be away for a couple of Sundays. And um, 50 pounds as a fraction of 20,000 is one quarter of a percent. A quarter of a percent. It's not sacrificial giving. And Paul here is talking about sacrificial giving. Giving um, something that is more than just loose change. It's about thinking about what we're giving and giving um, something that actually will cost us. Now, why does he do that? Well, he's, he talks about, look at verse 1 of chapter 8. He talks about the grace of God. We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. God's grace is all that God has done for us. It's undeserved. It's undeserved favor. Just look again at verse 9. Further down, this is a description of the grace of God. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. So what's going on there? Imagine Jesus up here in heaven. He's got all the riches of heaven, all the riches of God, and we're here in our poverty, particularly in our, um, in our sin. We are unholy. God is holy. There's this massive gap in between us. We, we are desperate without God. And Jesus gives up the treasure of being in heaven, all the riches of being in heaven, and becomes a human being like us in our poverty. And he exchanges all, that, all those riches. He says, you can have those and I'll take your poverty. This great exchange. I'll give you forgiveness. I'll give you new life. I'll give you hope. I'll give you a future. I'll give you treasure from heaven. 
if you put your trust in me and I will take on your poverty and, um, uh, and, take, and die a death that you deserve. That's grace. We don't deserve that, but Jesus has done that for us. So all those riches are at our disposal. And so when it comes to grace, which is what's operating in this, then we begin to see things in a different light. Everything we have has been given to us. We might think, oh, I've earned that, or um, you know, that's my mind by right. Actually, when we realize in the great scheme of things, actually everything has been given to us. Everything has been given to us. That completely changes our perspective. And the more mature we get as human beings, the more we realize that it's not what we've earned or not what we've worked for. It's what we've been given that is what we have and what we're about. And that grace is what the Macedonians had experienced. Even though they had severe trials, extreme poverty, they gave out of what they had. And they found even more to give, which is amazing. And as a result of that, God's love began to overflow from them in this act of sacrificial giving. So our giving should be financial. We want it to be like that. We want to capture some of that, um, that overflowing joy that is the result of giving like that. First book, sacrificial. Second thing we see here is generous, generosity. Because was this gift forced? No, it wasn't. Look at verse four, just a bit before. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. These guys were desperate to be a financial blessing. It's, it's like, you know, yeah, we don't care if we're poor. We've heard there are churches out there that need to be planted. There are churches out there that need, um, have great needs. We're going to not just give to our own church, but actually we're going to take an offering um, and then we're going to give that, um, give that away. That really excites us. We're, we can't wait for the opportunity. In fact, why, please, can you make it happen quicker? Entirely on there, they urgently pleaded us, with us for the privilege of sharing in this, um, in this service. Now, for me, I haven't, often experience people pleading with me to give money to um, the church or other churches. And I'm really open to that changing. Okay, so you know, we'd love to see um, people saying, please, 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 can we have another gift day? I'd love to be able to give, the chance to give again, to give like that. But that's what was going on here. That's generosity. That's generosity flowing. That is cultivated. You know, I long for um, the church worldwide and to be a church which has a huge culture of generosity that's what Jesus has done for us and we want to continue to inspire that and encourage that in our church in all churches a culture of generosity so that when people um, encounter it they, they spontaneously want to join in with it and give giving time giving energy giving resources giving money whatever it is that they have to give fantastic I love the fact that they went beyond Paul's expectations. Verse five, having given themselves first of all to the Lord, they also gave themselves by the will of God to us. So he encourages the Corinthians just to follow their example. The Corinthians have been doing as they'd obviously been doing it before. They'd got the idea. We urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, uh, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. I don't know what's going on there. Perhaps they had started to think about giving and they hadn't quite got around to it. They said they wanted to. And now the, the, Paul's saying, seal the deal. You've thought about giving. You like the idea of it. Now do it. Bring it to completion. Give what you um, want to be giving. And just how was that going on? Well, just chapter nine, verse six, Paul's encouraging them again. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. I love that, um, that phrase, to, if you sow generously, you will reap generously. This church is so generous. I just want to thank you for what you've been able to give, not just you as a group of people here, but you as the church that's been here over the last few years. You've enabled this church to come back to life. You've enabled churches, three other churches, to have a new life when they were going to be closed. That's because of your generosity. That wouldn't have happened if you hadn't given. So before, in 2004, between those four churches, there were something like 50 or 60 people in those churches, and they were all going to be closed or close to closure. 
Now there are over 500 worshipping committed members of those churches who go every week. Just, just attendance. There's actually more. That's about 700 or 800 people who are committed members of those churches. But we've got attendance of over 500 people a week in those churches. It's completely different because of your generosity. If this church hadn't given financially, that wouldn't have happened. That's amazing, isn't it? I'd love to, just to show you a, a video that you might have seen. Um, it's BBC News report that was from just before Christmas, so it's kind of in that Christmas season. And this is, this is what happens when you give money to another church, bringing it back to life. So um, uh, let's run this, the video of Adam. And, um, uh, the Church of England says the number of people attending services in the capital is at record levels. Congregations in London have increased by 16% over the last eight years. That compares to dwindling numbers across the country as a whole. Emma North has been to St Peter's Church in Bethnal Green, which is packed every Sunday, even outside the Christmas rush. This is a tale of two cities, one global, high profile and grand. <laughs> The other, local, intimate and cosy. Both sides of London are connected by the church. Three years ago, just 20 people would come to St Peter's in Bethnal Green. It's a little different now. The congregation has grown sixfold. It's in the middle of a bunch of estates and the church is really directly serving the local people. And it's just fantastic. For the first time I came, um, it was the winter, it was this time last year, and they were shoveling snow at people's doorways. High church mixes with the modern within the same service. The mince pies and mulled wine help too. But there's a realisation that if a church is to succeed, those who operate it need to roll up their sleeves. We've been involved in all sorts of things locally that mean that we're on the side of people. City safe havens on the Hackney Road, the food bank, connecting with schools, doing things with young people and things with older people, going out of the walls of the church. Britain's Church of England churches have seen 10% fewer people coming through their doors in the last decade. Now compare that with London. Churches, admittedly across all denominations, have seen a 16% growth in attendance, the majority among black and immigrant communities. Now, 9% of Londoners go to church once a week. At St Paul's yeah. Cathedral, the numbers are rising too. So, um, what an amazing thing to see a church turned around and a whole area just beginning to be reached in a new way because there's a new church playing its part in that place. Um, those statistics, in Tower Hamlets, it's less than 3% go to church. That's why we need to plant churches. There aren't enough churches in Tower Hamlets. We need to keep planting churches. We need to keep resourcing them and keep helping them. We need to keep growing this church community so that we can be a blessing, not just to this place, but so we can keep on planting churches. We can keep on giving away, giving people away, giving resources away, giving expertise away, giving money away. That's just such a privilege. Um, uh, some people say, well, you know, you've got so much already. Um, you know, I don't feel we, we need to give any, any money to you because you've got so much money. You know, actually, the truth is we've never got enough money. We are always kind of scraping around, um, trying to do the best with the resources that we have. And actually, this year, for, um, we, we've got a budget which is balanced, but it requires every single person to play their part. Some people will be able to give a lot. Other people will be able to give hardly anything. But every single bit counts. Every single penny counts towards the vision of the church. And please do be generous um, for, um, for this vision. So sacrificial, generous, generosity, and the third thing is being strategic. Our giving should be strategic. In verse 7 of chapter 9, Paul says this, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So what does this say? Well, four quick things. The first thing is to plan your giving. Plan it. Give what you have decided to give. To plan giving is to give a proportion of your income. It's to say, how much do I earn? And to, for the first act to be not what are the outgoings, but to say, how much am I going to give? 
In the Old Testament, they were encouraged to give what they called the first fruits of the harvest. So that was, you know, you take the harvest in and you get the first part, the best bits, and you give that as an offering to God. So with, so with our income, we take our income, as, we, as we're planning it, we say, okay, I'm going to give this much of my income to the Lord's work. And then we, we then look at tax, which is going to the government for, um, to support um, society. Um, we look at housing, we look at food, we look at entertainment, we look at holidays, we look at you know, whatever you do with your budgeting, which is a very important thing to do. Plan your giving. Um, Rockefeller was, um, is a very rich um, man and uh, uh, industry and um, family, and he said this, American um, industrialist said, I never would have been able to tithe, that's allocating one-tenth of his income and giving it to the church, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars I ever made if I had not tithed my first salary which was $1.50 per week. Now, my um, son heard this, and he gets £10 a month, and he said, I really want a bank account, so we gave him a bank account and put the £10 a month in, and um, he said, I want to give some of that money. He heard us talking about um, direct debits, and he said, I want to give a steward by stewardship, so he got the stewardship form, filled it all in, and he gives £2 of that £10 per month to the church. And because he'd heard this story, and he thought, well, when I get a million, <laughs> then... <laughs> but actually, that's the thing to do, is to start young. Start when you can. When you, if you're just starting out, decide to give right from the start. I started doing this when I was a student, and it's just so, it makes it so much easier later on when, you, uh, when I am earning hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's much easier to... <laughs> to do, I'm not. <laughs> but to give... You know, a proportion up front, and it's a simple thing. Plan your giving. Secondly, give it. Each of you should give. This might seem obvious, but lots of people would like to give, but they never actually get around to giving. Lots of people think they're generous, but they don't actually put their generosity into practice. So we need to actually make a stand. We need to actually do something about it. And it is amazing how difficult it is to actually part with cash. And I think that's why direct debits are so useful. Direct debits basically take, you know, they take a proportion of your income out of your bank account, you, you authorize it, and give to what you want to give to. And we encourage people to give to stewardship. Um, stewardship is a, um, it's a, a charity that is focused on helping people to be generous. So you give money to them, they take a little fee, it's like 2 or 3%, and we, we go through them because that amount of money, which they use for taking gift aid off and tax and so on, um, that is cheaper than if we were to process that work ourselves. So we actually ask them to do it, and we save money in the church. And we think, actually, in addition to encouraging people to give via stewardship back to us, they can also give to other charities and other um, situations and people and so on. So we think it's a fantastic thing. But um, I want to encourage people, if they haven't got a stewardship account, set up a stewardship account. You can do that today. Um, but also to use that account to give money directly to the church if you'd like to do that. I'd love, love to encourage you to do that. At, at the moment, there are 118 people involved with direct debits in the church. It's fantastic. We, can we just have a chart that shows... That's the kind of um, direct debits that people are giving. So um, of the 118, lots are under 100 pounds. Some are between 100 and 200, 200 and 300, 300 and 500, and over 500. Um, so it's amazing. It's some, uh, you know, all of that is generous giving. There are a whole range of different amounts. And um, if you're taking it out, the question for you is actually, what, what do I want to give? People have been taking out direct debits today, which is fantastic. I'd love to see half the church giving in this way. Um, half the church is about 175 adults. Um, and so that's another 118 to 175 is 57. Is that right? So 57 more people involved in direct debits would be amazing as a result today. We had some this morning. Perhaps some of you might like to start those today as well. But please give this way if you can. Recognize that not everyone is able to do this, but it's a fantastic way of doing it. Third thing we see here is to celebrate giving. He says you shouldn't give reluctantly or under compulsion, 
for God loves a cheerful giver. That's why I, I, you know, we love gift days here. So we're going to have a celebration in a few minutes' time. We're going to have bowls out. We can chuck money in. We have chocolates to give out. We, um, it's cheerful because Paul says here, God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful is hilarious. Hilarion is the Greek word. So we're going to try and have hilarious giving. Uh, what does that look like, hilarious giving? I don't know. We'll, we'll see, shall we? That's, I'd, I'd like to kind of give that a go. Um, but party, we need party poppers, balloons. That's what um, he's trying to encourage, actually, that atmosphere in giving. And fourthly, direct it. So generously. Don't so sparingly, so generously. Sow it in places that's going to bear fruit, where it's going to make a difference. And that's why we encourage people to sow into this church. It makes a difference. You know, I think that we are one of the most effective ways of delivering um, uh, a return for income because we are so careful with the money that we give. We've got fantastic structures. Jackie Driver is a, was a KPMG partner. She now works virtually full-time either for the church or different charities, City Gateway and other places, just giving her expertise. But she's made sure that all the processes are good, and that's a good thing. You heard of Kraft Cheese, the guy who um, headed that up, J.L. Kraft. He um, gave masses of money to um, Christian causes, and he said this, um, Uh, something like 25% of his income went to various um, charitable causes. And he said this, the only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I've given to the Lord. So in a moment, I'm going to encourage you to give. And um, there are various ways we do that. So on your seats, you'll find this um, little card. Um, Um, We used this last week. This is like a tick box card and um, you take your pen and you just think, okay, if I'm not a member, I'm going to join the church or I'm going to do Alpha. I want to get into a connect group. Tick that and um, please talk to us if you'd like to do that. Other tick, I'd love to pray for the church. We need as much prayer as we can get. And I want to encourage you daily, please pray. God bless St. Paul's shadow. Enable them to, um, enable them, enable us to be able to do all that you want us to do because we're a part of this church. Thirdly, how can I serve in um, my church? And uh, just tick that if you're involved in a, in a ministry or if you want to join in with a ministry. We had some ministry opportunities last week. And there are various ways you can get involved in the life of church. It, just ask any of the leaders to um, a way to serve in the night shelter or in the worship team or um, welcoming team or um, children's team. Lots and lots of different ways. Tick that if you'd like to be involved in that. And the fourth thing, give. I'm going to give. I'm going to commit to giving to the church in whichever way you feel God's calling you to do that. So that's a little aid memoir, and um, uh, that's for you to use. Second thing, I don't know if these are on the seats. They're on the tables. So there's a little slip like this. This is a giving slip, and today we're using these. In um, uh, If you're a member of stewardship, then you can actually fill this in and attach a check or cash, and they, they'll get the gift aid for for you if you fill in the details right. Otherwise, just fill this in and say, I'd like to pledge some money. And um, it's a way of actually saying, I, I'd like to give, you know, we did this this morning, we, we wrote in the, the amount, said we're gonna give this much, and we've been processing that today, and, and you can drop that in the bowl as well. If you wanna find out more about the church, there's an A5 slip of paper that has the overall feel of the, you know, the general categories of the budget, please do have a look at that. And um, any questions about that, please do speak to Jackie Driver or one of the leaders. Um, and if you'd like to take out a standing order, so this or direct debit, I beg your pardon. Um, this is a stewardship form there at the back of church, um, and you just fill in the details. You can actually um, go online. So is that Aaron there? Aaron, hello. So just wave again, Aaron. He's the one with the green lights all shining around him like a zombie. Um, so um, he is, he's online at the moment, and you can sign up with stewardship or give with stewardship if you'd like to do that as well. I'd love to just finish by um, telling you the story of someone I heard about on Friday, whose name is Sir Nicholas Winton. This is um, his uh, picture. He's 104 this week. And Sir Nicholas Winton um, was in Germany in 1938, and he saw the plight of the Jewish people as they were being persecuted by the Nazis. And he 
realized that um, something awful was brewing. And he just thought, we've got to get the children out of here. And so he organized for um, families in England to take children, uh, to adopt them or to look after them um, through the, the, the turbulent period that, was, that he thought was going to follow. And he arranged for 668 children to be rescued from that situation. And they were put onto what came to be known as kinder transport. There were trains that um, took the children um, through Europe to England, and they were adopted by these families. Every single one of those families died in the death camps. So the only ones to be rescued were those children that Sir Nicholas Winton arranged for, paid for tickets, paid for um, uh, the, all the arrangements to be made, and organized that on, uh, in, on, in, his own, on his own, in his own time. He, 1939 came, war broke out. Um, it was literally weeks um, before this happened that the, these children were saved, and they stopped all the transport. And he went back to England. He became a pilot and um, uh, fought in, um, in that war. And he didn't, he, life moved on. He um, got on with his life. And his wife, um, in the 80s, was rifling through um, their attic. And she came across a box full of papers. And on, in these papers, it had children's names, addresses, and um, names of families in Germany and families in England. And there were always details. And she said, what? What, what is this all about? He said, oh, um, that was something I was doing before the war. And he didn't, you know, you know and she pressed him, say, what, what, what is this all about? And he was quite nonchalant about the whole thing. And he told her the story. And um, word got out, and they, um, Esther Ranson, who was this uh, presenter in the 80s and 90s, she um, hosted this program called This Is Your Life. And they would get out, uh, they'd focus on a person, get all the people that they'd influenced ar around them and um, tell the story of this person. It's usually a surprise. And they did this with this person, um, Nicholas Winton. And the first thing that happened, you can see it if you Google it, is that um, the presenter just says, the person on your left is one of these children that you helped. And he looked at her and he introduced her, um, he met her and talked to her and... Um, he, you could see that he was visibly moved by this, and he, it was almost like he wanted to move on from this particular situation. But then she said, would everyone who is in the audience today um, please stand up if, you, uh, if, you're, if you're alive because of Sir Nicholas Winton? And at that moment, tens and tens of people stood up all around him. They placed these people all right, right around him in the audience. And it was a very moving moment just seeing all these people stand. But then he is aware that something's going on. He's, he turns around and stands up and sees these people. And he's speechless. And these people owed their lives to the act of courage and generosity of this man. He didn't think anything of it. He moved on in his life and, and went on to do other things. It was part of his service, part of his character to do that act. For us today, God doesn't want us to put off to tomorrow acts of courage and service like that. God calls each one of us to say, I'm going to do something today. I'm going to make a difference today. I'm going to serve God today. I'm going to give my time, my passion, my service, my money, not just as St. Paul's, but actually to the life that you've called me to live. I think the thing that this encouragement from Paul's letter to the Corinthians is, is the same thing. Don't hold back on your giving. Don't hold back on serving God's purposes in the world today. Wherever he's called you to be, in your workplace, in your community, your passions, your gifts, your, um, your skills, your time, your money, give it to God now. Say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go for it. I'm not going to let the dream be something in the future. I'm going to start now. 668 people 
thanked Sir Nicholas Winton for the part that he played in rescuing them. What will people in the future say to you? Would you like to stand and let's pray and then we'll work out what to do next. Thank you.